Even if in Copenhagen the nations of the world have said we're all going to commit to cutting carbon dioxide emissions 80 percent, um, that um, the work still needed to be done. Right? It wasn't like it was going to happen overnight just because there was a law in place. And that was really the genesis of the idea of C2C Fellows, is that many of you kind of get this. You've heard this all your lives now. It's nothing new to you. But it's probably, the challenge is that it's always framed as this, well, it's impossible. How could we ever do this? You know? Um, but if we think of it as a, an issue of, well, let's try. <laughs> and what would that mean to actually devote your career to solving this problem? And what are the skills that I don't have that I need to do that? That, that's kind of the idea behind C2C fellows is, okay, the work has to get done whether the law is in place or not. Um, so let's figure out how to do it. That's kind of why we're here. Um, and so the question is, you know, when we get to 2043, will we have, you know, will we be stabilizing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at maybe 440 parts per million? Or will we just keep doing what we're doing and you know, be on track for a much higher world. And I'm going to show you just a couple more pictures uh, before we get to the happy part of the talk. This is kind of the depressing part, right? Um, so this is that ten, last 10,000 years that I showed you, that little red spot, you know, at the end of the graph, the other graph. Um, and this came out in Science Magazine last year. This is our best reconstruction of what global average temperatures have looked like over the last 10,000 years. It's a 100-year resolution, so it wouldn't pick up decadal averages, but, you know, what you can see is that temperatures haven't fluctuated by more than, say, half a degree up or down from, from the average in the whole of human history, right? Animal husbandry, building the cities, and here we are today, okay? You can see this, you know, plants heated up about a degree and a half Fahrenheit since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and this is where the World Bank says we're going. It's where the World Bank says we're going within your life that if, if the nations of the earth met all the commitments that they set in, in Copenhagen, the U.S. is committed to a 17% reduction by below 2006 levels. This is where we're headed. Roughly 800 parts per million by the end of the century and a nine degree Fahrenheit warning, eight or nine. This is a brick wall, right? This, we cannot go here. This is just not the world that any of us wants to inhabit or inherit. So, the mission of C2C Fellows is we gotta bend this curve, right? We gotta bend this curve so that it tops out at four degrees F. Now that's gonna be a challenging world, right? It's only warmed up a degree and a half Fahrenheit. We've already seen the consequences, right? But this is what we can do, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Before we do, I wanna show you one more picture. Um, again, oh, and there we are. There you are, right? That's your generation, my graduate students. You guys are gonna go. Okay. Um, okay, here we go. Let's go to the hack part. Okay? So, you know, that seems very daunting. So, the good news is that um, this is really um, not a technical or economic problem. We absolutely can do this. We know how to do this. We know how to bend that curve, right? So, if we wanted to hold that carbon blanket at 450 parts per million, hold the planet to 2 degrees C or 4 degrees F warming. This is what we've got to do, okay? Here we are in 2012 at about 334 billion tons of carbon emitted every year. Uh, if we keep doing what we're doing by 2050 or so, when I'm an old man, uh, we'll be at 62 billion tons, we'll double that, and that's a recipe for planetary suicide. Uh, but here's what we can do, is by 2050 we can cut emissions more than half, get down to 14 billion tons, um, and then by the end of the century completely eliminate carbon from the economy. Okay, you're going, am I sure I came to the right conference? I mean, I thought this was supposed to be the good news part of the talk, right? You look at that and you go, well, that seems impossible. How could we do that? But challenge you to think, what was the major emission source, pollution source from the transportation sector 100 years ago? Just at the beginning of World War I. Nope, transportation. Trains. Not trains. Horses. Horse poop. Horse poop, right? We have definitely managed to reduce emissions of horse poop by well over 90% over the last 100 years, right? We did that. Okay? Um, and 
So that's all we, all we had to do now. We went from horses to cars. We got it from cars to something else. And that something else is really well known. We've got to produce electricity from clean energy sources, wind, solar, geothermal, uh, sustainable biofuels. And once we have that electricity, then we can use it to run our vehicles on batteries or make hydrogen and burn the hydrogen or run it through fuel cells or use sustainable biofuels. So there's a very rich menu of technological opportunities that would allow us to unhook from this addiction to fossil fuels right? um, and make this rapid transition. And this picture is what's called a wedge picture. It shows a bunch of these. So right, you know, you can get a wedge of a lot of fuel efficiency, which is the gray stuff. Um, some a lot of renewables here, which is the green stuff. Uh, carbon capture and sequestration at the top. Maybe that will work, maybe it won't. This one's got a little nuclear in it. There's a whole variety of approaches you could take. Um, none of these are required. You can kind of swap them out. We know how to do this. These are known technologies. We can produce the power we need if we put our minds to it without using carbon-based fuels. And we can afford it. So kind of look at this are in pretty significant consensus that if we wanted to hold the planet to two degrees centigrade, we could do it. It would not break the bank. It would be affordable, right? This is one analysis from McKinsey and Company. It's a big global business consulting firm. They looked at it, and here what they've done is they've broken down some of those technologies you saw before and figured out, in some cases, you're actually going to save money if you switch over to them. So this one that saves the most money is a switch from incandescent to LED light bulbs. They save so much electricity that they actually reduce carbon and save you money at the same time. Uh, landfill gas is one of these. Uh, uh, right in here, I believe. So that's going to save you money if you trap the methane that's coming out of landfills right now and turn it into electricity, you're going to save money. Some of this stuff costs money. Um, so here's some solar photovoltaics. Uh, organic soil development could cost more money. And then the most expensive is actually this carbon capture and sequestration where you actually pull carbon out of the stacks and bury it in the ground. Um, but if you think about the money you're going to save and the money you're going to spend, those things roughly balance out of this analysis. But basically, economists would look at this and say, we can do this. It's absolutely affordable. Um, and it's investments in the future. <coughs> Wind power is a great example, right? If you go back to when I was in college, 1980, no such thing as wind power. did not exist. There was not a wind turbine on the planet outside of maybe some experimental one somewhere. Right? You guys now know that the planet is sort of littered with these things. Uh, I think that'd be worth it. Uh, they're sprouting up all over the place in beautiful forests of wind turbines rather than living, okay? Um, and uh, this was policy driven, you know, concern of uh, dependence on living east oil. The United States put a lot of money into research and development for wind power. By the mid 90s, California was the world leader in installed wind power capacity. Prices were down six, seven cents an hour to an hour. Now we're out here at 400,000 megawatts, 300,000 megawatts installed worldwide. And if you've got access to a good site and transmission, wind power is now the cheapest electricity generating source in the world. And it's one of the fastest growing along with solar. So we're investing now in a whole suite of other technologies, fuel cells, battery storage, solar photovoltaics, which are also coming down dramatically in price. And, and I'm sure you can envision how we would do this, right? Uh, we would have to scale up all of those solutions in the same way we're scaling up wind power to phase out carbon-based fuels. And it can be done. I'm going to leave you with one more um, picture. Uh, that's not a pretty picture. And we talked, I showed you a bunch of slides of kind of the impacts of climate change now, the impacts of climate change that we're feeling. And those fall into two categories, right? One of the two categories of things that we're, are hitting us now. Droughts and floods, right? Droughts and floods. Droughts are easy to understand because as you heat things up, it dries out. Right? Fair enough. Why floods? Why are we getting more extreme precipitation events? Yeah. Yeah, because there's no more water. There's not enough water in the troposphere, which moderates extreme weather events. Okay. Uh, another way to say it, or, or a related issue, is yeah. 
Uh, you're getting more evaporation in the system, yeah. So a hotter world means more evaporation, uh, more, uh, the, the atmosphere is actually holding, I think about eight or nine percent more water vapor than it did a hundred years ago. And that water's gonna come down in bigger bursts, yeah. Well, water doesn't disappear. Have to go somewhere. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, and that water's getting evaporated. It's got to go somewhere, and it's coming down in extreme weather events. Okay, and that you know, again, I'm not going to blame a snowstorm on that, but this is certainly extreme weather, right? Uh, you know, as I said, never experienced this in my lifetime in New England. I spent a lot of years. Um, so floods and droughts. Floods are damaging. Droughts are deadly. Um, and so this is a picture of the world. This is the current drought conditions. And, and ironically, this was put together by scientists at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, NCAR. This is their analysis. You know what happened to NCAR about three months ago? Their offices were washed away in an unprecedented, historic, never before seen flood in Colorado. Um, so, anyway, this is their analysis. And if you look, what is, read this, anything to the left of this magenta color, this brown, dark brown, is extreme drought. For the, for the area, okay? And if you look at the United States, last decade, really only there's a little patch in the middle of that magenta, a little patch of dark brown, like in Wyoming somewhere. That was the only place that was experiencing extreme drought in the US. This is what scientists at NCAR say the world might look like if we follow that World Bank trajectory and we're at about 800 parts per million CO2, eight, seven or eight degrees Fahrenheit warming. Okay, this is not a pretty picture. Okay? Uh, and there's a lot of change there, which is a little hard to read, but let me read it for you. If you draw a line from Virginia up to the Great Lakes into central Canada, down into northern California, all the way down through Latin America into you know, Venezuela and into the heart of the Amazon, all of that goes into extreme drought. Correct. Or as far as humans are concerned. What happens if the Amazon goes into extreme drought? Trees die and they burn down. Right. So basically this, this environment flips from rainforest to savanna. Um, that pumps billions of additional tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and drives further warming. Right. So it gives you a sense of, of how sensitive the planet's system is to change. Okay, so one of the tricks to, um, to, and if you want to go in and to pursue a sustainability career in your life, one of the things you have to do is you have to play a mental game with yourself. Um, and you have to say, you, you have to, you don't have you, have, you can't stick your head in the sand around these pictures, right? Most people don't want to know this. And most people are content to go through their lives not paying any attention to this, right? But if you're pursuing a sustainability career, what you're saying is, I'm the kind of person whose eyes are wide open to this. And it doesn't paralyze me, it motivates me. Right? You look at this picture and you don't go, oh my God, I'm going to go drink beer somewhere. Uh, <laughs> you know, you go, oh, this is what I'm working for to make sure that this doesn't happen. Um, so, you know, it really is, a, uh, it, it, it can be pretty discouraging sometimes to keep your eyes open. Um, uh, but it's what you have to do, right? You have to somehow do a mental thing where these kind of Bad news stories are motivating and not, uh, to be honest, you know, I read one this morning. I, it gets hard. It gets hard. I mean, I read one in Huffington Post about three signs that we're losing the war on global warming. And I'm going, oh, gosh. You know? And then I said, well, what's in that final paragraph that's going to make me you know, want to get out of bed in the morning? Um, and there wasn't, <laughs> wasn't really a lot there. So I had to kind of get myself out of bed you know, and realize that, you know, he basically said we need a carbon tax, we need a global, you know, we need national action. We do, right? You know, we need businesses to get out there and innovate as well. So we'll talk about that. Okay. So that's the world we live in. This is the world, and this, again, global warming is just one dimension of this. I think it's an overarching dimension. You may not be interested in climate change, but it's interested in you. Um, uh, and if you're working on population or, or gender or endangered species, any of these issues, they're all going to be wrapped around each other. Energy, it's all to get one big bubble. Um, and that's good because it means the solution for one problem is a solution for many problems. So 
how are we going to fix this? What are we going to do? Um, and I think it's important to recognize that we are living at an extraordinary moment, not only in terms of what's happening to the climate, but also what's happening to our politics and our economy. Right? So again, what else is unprecedented going on? Well, how about 8% unemployment, 7.5% unemployment? Five years of that. I don't have to tell you guys this, but this has never before been experienced in my lifetime. Right? Any other period of five years of 7.5% unemployment it would have been a crisis. But now it's kind of become the new norm. Um, the level of political polarization we have in Washington, D.C. probably not been seen in the United States since before the Civil War. Okay? That's the kind of gridlock that we're experiencing. So that political trends, those economic trends are unsustainable. They will change. They will, so we're at a moment where there's a lot of room and there is a lot of hand out energy for, for change. Um, and we also have these sort of amazing technologies in, in our hands that can drive that change. And, uh, and you guys know this as well, right? You're, you're wired to connect. So if, if you asked somebody three years ago, what is the 99%, what would they have said to you? Yeah, it'd be a sale at Walmart or something like that, right? You know, I don't know, what is it, okay? But now, billions of people around the world know what the 99% is, right? Billions of people know what that is. Talk to students in Korea and Argentina, they know what that is. It's really incredible, okay? And this is where, you know, especially these days, Margaret Mead once said, she's an anthropologist, famously said, never underestimate the power of a small group of people to change the world. Say that again. Never underestimate the power of a small group of people to change the world. Indeed, why? You know? Okay. It's all that ever has. Yeah, it's the only thing that ever has. If you think about any change that's ever impacted the world, it started with two people having coffee and talking about it, right? Every change that's changed the world started from two or three people having coffee somewhere with an idea, okay? And, and this is an obvious example, you know. A bunch of young people sat down in Zuccotti Park and had this brilliant marketing vision of the 99%, and it's really changed the global dialogue in a very powerful way. So that's me getting arrested. Um, and it actually wasn't at Occupy Wall Street. It was the month before Occupy Wall Street. If you'd asked anybody three years ago, what's the Keystone Pipeline, what would they have said to you? Key what? But yeah, yeah, that's what they would have said. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is it like, I don't know, what is it, Keystone, Pennsylvania? I don't know. Um, but now, you know, this is uh, incredibly, you know, most people in this room probably know what the Keystone Pipeline is. Um, and the reason is that, you know, Bill McKibben and a few other environmental leaders said, we've got to raise awareness about this. They called for, uh, you know, mass civil disobedience in Washington, D.C. About 1,000 people got arrested. That was one of them. And that kind of set in motion a process that forced Obama to put the brakes on this. Might still happen. But there's been a three-year delay as a consequence, and it really was become a central and divisive you know, sort of uh, question in American politics. Um, so uh, it was a beautiful day. Uh, we, we, we sat down in front of the White House, and you can't do that. It's against the law. And the police told us that. It's good to know. Um, so I was talking to my friend John Pascatanda, who runs Greenpeace. And we were just chatting, you know. And they came to arrest the women first. And then they arrested the guys. Um, and they took us away to the paddy wagon. And so we're all, you know, a couple dozen of us are sitting in the paddy wagon, you know, just kind of having a good time. And there's some young guys over at one end of the van. And they go, hey, you guys should come up to Wall Street in a couple weeks. It's going to be really big. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> You know, I've heard that before. You know, you guys going to have a little protest. You guys are going to get arrested. <laughs> Uh, and I was totally wrong, you know, and that's kind of what c to c Fellows is about, is those ideas that old people like me dismiss that, in fact, have the sort of incredible power to change, to change the world, okay? Um, now, this is politics, right? And you've got to do politics. Politics is important. But it's not really the focus of c to c Fellows. I'm not talking about political activism here. We want to focus instead on... How do you actually get paid to do this? How do you actually build a career solving these problems? And 
in my mind, there's three different ways to do that. There's sort of three buckets of uh, career approaches that you can do to, to, to save the planet. Again, recognizing the planet doesn't really need your help. Um, people do. Okay, the first one is education, broadly defined. So, uh, but and by that I mean not just being a teacher, but also being a researcher, or a preacher, or a rabbi, or an imam, or an artist, or a journalist. Anybody whose job it is to kind of tell the story, uh, raise, uh, engage people with the moral and scientific dimensions of the sustainability challenge that it fits. Won't talk much more about that approach. I think you guys are probably pretty familiar with it. The other two, and partially because I got graduate programs in both of those other spaces, um, are policy and business. And that's what we're going to focus on here, uh, mostly in the CDC context. So a policy career, if you're going to pursue a policy career, that's a career about changing the rules. Your policy is rules. So if you want to pursue a policy career, you want to pursue a career changing the rules. And those rules are set at the international level. See that tomorrow night in the climate negotiations? At the national level, within cities and states, also within companies. Um, any of you have done work with the sustainability coordinators on your campus? Those are people who are policy people, right? They're trying to change the rules within your colleges to make behavior more sustainable. Microsoft recently introduced an internal carbon tax um, so that if you're a manager at Microsoft and you want to send a team to China, you got to pay for their airfare, you got to pay for their hotels, and you got to pay the company out of your budget five dollars a ton for every uh, carbon submitted as a consequence. Now why would Microsoft do that? What would it do? If I put in a carbon tax in place, yep. Absolutely. So what do you do instead of going to China? You'll Skype them, okay? It'll drive a change from actual travel to video conferencing. And probably save the company a lot of money because people like to travel and they probably do more of it than they need to. Okay? Um, Microsoft is taking that pool of money and dedicating it to investing in renewables and efficiency so that they're going to be more resilient in the face of, you know, carbon shocks. Um, so that's an example of policy within the context of a business. Um, so that's one avenue that you can pursue. And you can get careers in policy, you know, as I said, the private sector, NGOs, or in government. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Business, if you want to pursue a career in sustainability, business sustainability, then really what you're doing is you're saying, you know, given the rules of the game, I want to play the game. And green business is really about playing the game. Like I say, the rules are what the rules are, Within the context of those rules, I'm going to build a financially viable organization, whether that's a for-profit or a non-profit, that actually solves social and environmental problems. Okay. So there are different career paths. They obviously overlap. I mean, businesses lobby for policy, and policy people are trying to get businesses engaged. Um, but they really are really sort of the different, different avenues. So let me talk a little bit more about those. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, I run these two graduate programs. Um, one of them is here at Bard. It's a Master's of Science program. We have two tracks, Environmental Policy and Climate Science and Policy. A little bit of graduate school advice. Um, how many of you are seniors, juniors, sophomores, first years, uh, graduates? OK. So some of you thinking about graduate school already. Uh, and um, most master's programs have what I call a, a cafeteria style structure, where you take two or three core classes, and then you take five from a list of 15, and six from a list of 20, and then there's a capstone. Um, at Bard, we have a different structure. So we can press all the academics into one, most of the academics into one year. So you take a year of either environmental or climate science, a year of environmental and natural resource economics, a year of uh, policy, statistics, kind of metrics, GIS. There's a J term when you go to Mexico or study land conservation. And then students go off and do a four to six month internship. High level internship. Department of Energy, EPA, off in Alaska looking at ocean acidification or China looking at you know, lake management. Students then return to campus unless they actually get a job, which they get in case they stay away. But in either case, they're going to work on a thesis in the second semester of their second year. Um, so that's the structure of our program. 
And piece of advice, I would say if you're looking at graduate school and it's a terminal degree, a master's degree that you want to be able to push you out in the workforce where you can make a difference, find one that has a strong career focus. Because you know, master's degree programs are not necessarily that. Um, and uh, I think ours is very well designed around it because it is extended internship that we put at the center of it. Um, not only is that a strong career focus, I mean, I think if you're going to change the world, you have to go out there and actually experience how it works and reflect on that in an academic context. So I would urge you to make sure that there's a strong experiential component to any master's program that you pursue. Okay? So, um, so here's some examples. So Patrick DiCiacco was a student um, and came to us, uh, did his internship at the Department of Energy. Uh, and so he's in the government, government policy, right? And his shop was in charge of taking proposals from industry um, to help them get more energy efficiency, efficient. Uh, he had a proposal come from a hotel chain that wanted to get improve their energy efficiency. And Patrick thought, well, you know, rather than us do this for them, why don't we farm this out to college and university energy clubs and have them do it in a contest, Berkeley, MIT, and other places. Um, and uh, Patrick actually had the opportunity to pitch that idea directly to the cabinet secretary at the time, the energy secretary Chu. And Chu liked it so much that he greenlighted it on the spot. And they actually hired Patrick to do that. So Patrick was, uh, came back to us to work on his thesis, but was also consulting for DOE. And he took that project from inception in November to completion in March, organized an award ceremony in the White House, and then two weeks later got a call to go work for the Office of Management and Budget down in Washington. For those of you who know, OMB is like nerve central for deciding whether or not environmental policies, regulations, live or die. So Patrick was really at the heart of, of that kind of conversation at the national level in terms of, of government policy. This is Rachel Savain. Um, Rachel was a French major at Williams, actually, uh, environmental studies minor, came and got tooled up through our core curriculum, uh, went to Haiti to work on solid <coughs> waste issues. For those of you who spent time in developing countries, you know that just litter, garbage, is a horrible problem, the streets lined with garbage, because they don't have a mechanism for dealing with this. So she got an, an, an internship working for a Dutch NGO that was building a landfill outside of Port-au-Prince. And she landed there. Her job was to actually interview the people who were trying to handle the waste in an informal way, informal waste haulers, figure out how they would fit into a modern system. Got a motorcycle, rode around, became known as the motorcycle girl. They liked her so much that they hired her on. So she was consulting for us while finishing her thesis. Because only for them, while finishing her thesis, she subsequently rolled into a two-year job with them. So she went from being you know, kind of a French major, wasn't sure what she was going to do with her life, to now at 25, will have spent two and a half years working in one of the hardest developing countries in the world to operate in. That's Keith McHugh, really wanted to do private sector work, policy work, got an internship working for Autodesk out in San Francisco, a big uh, uh, architectural software firm. They've got a lot of servers, helped them save energy. And then he moved into a job with Ocean Spray. Um, so he is now helping to green the cranberry. Uh, so these are kind of illustrations of what a policy career how a policy career starts, right? Uh, in government, working you know, directly on environmental regulations and policy. In the nonprofit sector, uh, in this case, trying to influence the Haitian government and sort of uh, create sort of private part partnerships that are going to be effective in solving environmental and social problems. And then working in the private sector, um, trying to develop sustainability guidelines to drive uh, the greening of, of businesses. So we'll switch gears and talk a little bit about sustainable business. I don't have any graduates from our MBA program yet. It's a new program. We'll be graduating our first class in May. Um, and again, this whole idea of sustainable business is a really new one. You know, it, it's really a new idea in political economy. It sort of didn't exist before 1995. You know, there's some proto thought going on, but in the mid 90s, some companies began to say, you know, instead of thinking about environmental and social problems as problems, costs to be externalized, which was a traditional way to think about these things, let's think about them as opportunities to be profitably solved, potentially. Right? So what a sustainable business is, again, at its core, is going to be a business that's not in business to make money. That's not the reason they're in business. But instead, they're in business to solve social or environmental problems. 
they have to make money because otherwise they won't be able to exist um, or, or grow, but that's not their point. Their point is to solve a social and environmental problem. Okay, examples. My favorite example is EcoVid, uh, which was started by a couple of engineers up in Troy from uh, RPI, and their mission, the reason their company exists, is to remove styrofoam from the face of the earth. Okay? So if you think about styrofoam, right, it's an example of how we're not going to solve the needs of 11 billion people in the world of limited resources. To make styrofoam, you've got to go and drill for oil in some sensitive habitat in the Niger Delta or the Gulf of Mexico. You've got to spill it, destroy the local ecosystem. You've got to transport it. You've got to spill it again. You've got to heat it up to extremely high temperatures. You know, poison the workers, poison the communities. And then you ship it out. It's got a useful life to consumers for about three weeks. And then they throw it away. Uh, no such thing as throwing anything away. But they think they're throwing it away. And it lasts for 10,000 years in the environment. So what Ecovative did was they said, how would nature solve this problem? You've got a packing problem. How is nature going to solve this problem? And that's a key sort of foundation to the sustainable business vision is inspiration from nature in terms of design. Because in nature, in engineering design solutions for 4 billion years, no such thing as waste. Right? All waste is food. There's no such thing as pollution in nature. All waste is food. Nature, no energy crisis. Right? Abundant solar energy drives all natural processes. Nature, no systems too big to fail. No banks that come crashing down and destroy natural systems. So what can we learn from nature in thinking about how we design our businesses? So what this company does is they grow big blocks of mushrooms, um, really tightly interwoven fungus, in dark rooms at room temperature, and then they kill it. And then they chop it up for shipping peanuts. Or they can grow it in molds to put around computer screens. Um, and it's an extremely cool idea. Uh, took them a few years to get the science right, uh, do the R&D, but they've achieved that goal. And um, they've now partnered with some big waste, um, I'm sorry, shipping companies. And um, you know, they're going to do this. They're, they're going to largely uh, you know, remove styrofoam from, from the packing industry, shipping industry. You know, and when consumers are done with the product, again, they can just chop it up and put it in the garden for compost. Okay. So that, that's an example of a sustainable business. You've got big corporates like Nike and Levi's and others um, who really got into sustainability business from the labor end, right? They were on the forefront of kind of sweatshop labor in the 90s. Uh, and initially, those companies resisted that. They said, you know, well, it's not our problem. It's our contract factories. We're not responsible. But pretty soon they realized, you know, in an era of transparent supply chains, they really need to get ahead of that. So they, they took responsibility and became leaders in terms of sustainable uh, labor practices, but also environment. So Nike recently looked at their footprint, their environmental footprint, and they said, you know, we're a leading cause of water pollution in developing countries. <laughs> and rather than kind of pat themselves on the back and say we're obeying the laws in Vietnam or wherever, um, Nike said, no, you know, we're going to take responsibility for this. And they've innovated and created a waterless dyeing process. So they're actually going to phase out water-based dyeing and this water pollution problem in much of their textile manufacturing in the developing world. And they're going to make money doing it. Because they're at the forefront of the technology, other people are going to follow, and they're going to be the leaders in this sector. So that's just a couple of examples of what, you know, how sustainability is impacting the business world. So again, why are you here? We want to help you guys find the intersection of what you do well, what you love, what the world needs, and what the world can pay for, which is bliss. Okay? So we're searching for bliss this weekend. That's our goal. And again, that, oh yeah. I want to leave you with one message. Uh, we'll talk more about this this weekend. But the basic message is don't wait to find bliss. Go right for it, okay? Um, Suppose at age 26, you know, you wanted to, we talked about this, and you guys have already done this, you've answered these questions in your um, applications. Represent a million people in others, or run a successful great startup. Um, do it, okay? Just, you know, just do it. Um, because, for two reasons. One is, can't wait. I mean, you know, if you really want to change the world, 
Um, this is one area where we really can't wait. We've got kind of three decades to get this done. Um, and um, we need you. you know, we need you in your 20s making a difference, not make a difference in your 30s or 40s, because then it gets really hard to get the work done. Um, the other thing, though, is you know, your 20s are a decade where you're just absolutely free, right? Uh, or as free as you'll ever be. You, know, you don't have mortgage debt. You don't have babies, by and large. Um, and you know, you've got some student debt, yes. But you know, you're never going to be in a position where you can take more risks than you are in your 20s. Um, and what we're going to talk about this weekend is sort of, OK, that's not all well and good. I'm 19. How can I possibly do these things? Um, what do I need that I don't have uh, to make this kind of difference? Well, actually, let me ask you. What are some of the things you would need to change the world in your 20s that you don't feel like you have now to be kind of a, a political leader or a, or, a, or a business innovator? What do you need that you don't have? Now? Yeah. A network. You need a strong network. Okay. You've got the beginning of a network, but it's not a powerful network. Okay. What else do you need? Yeah. Funding. You need the funding, okay? Uh, what else do you need? Yeah. Technical skills, like expertise, okay. and just expertise that you need to experience to learn. All right, you got to know some stuff yeah. uh, to sort of support support the direction you want to go. What else do you need? Well, this kind of goes along with having a strong network, um, promoting uh, an idea or going for a goal that everybody else can agree with or okay. it's going to be inspired right. to do. Okay, but you also actually have to have your own goal, right? If you want to really drive change, you have to have a vision that other people buy into, right? Right. But you do have to have that vision. You have to have a business vision or a policy vision that you want to pursue, right? What else? That's what I was going to say, just a better vision or um, a better idea of what you want to accomplish. Okay. So <laughs> funding, network, vision, what else? You need the time to execute the goal. Okay, I'm going to submit that in your 20s you've got that time. <laughs> if you choose to, if you choose to grab. What else? Yeah. You need to create yourself a brand. Kind of something to market yourself and your goals. Okay. You've got to, you have to somehow, I'm going to reframe that, say so you've got to be a persuasive communicator around your vision. And a brand would be a good way to do that, right? So, yeah, what else? I need a lot of patience. Patience, okay. Um, it's a good. And maybe some impatience too, actually. Because if you're not impatient, you, you might be too patient. You might just wait around for <laughs> days and a half and then maybe it wouldn't. So I think patience and impatience. Yeah, what else? understanding and support. Okay. All right. Okay, so you guys have said this is what we're going to work on this weekend, these things, all right? We're going to work on a vision, right? You can't really be a leader. You can't drive this change unless you start with some vision of, of how you want to change the world. Um, you got to know yourself. You got to understand who you are as a leader. You got to have some courage because you're going to fail. People are going to tell you no, and you got to be willing to pick yourself up and and move forwards. Uh, you got to have a strong network. No question about that. You got to be able to ask people for stuff. And this is to me really key. You got to be able to ask people for their support, for their money, for their time, to be able to raise those funds to create where you want to go. And then you've got to be, you've got to be able to brand it. Right? You've got to be a persuasive communicator, uh, oral communicator, written communicator, um, to engage people around us. This is what we're going to work on this weekend. Um, and it's sort of the whole vision of C2C Fellows. Is we know you guys are out there. You don't need to be educated about global warming and how big the problems are and how we're never going to solve it. What you need is the skill set to go out there and make a difference. And so that's the vision of the network. Um, uh, what is the network about? Well, uh, we're going to have a careers camp this summer. If you have fun this weekend, we're going to be doing this a little more intensely and with some more professional trainers this summer. So we're going to be creating one second round opportunity where we put about 250 people through these trainings a year, and we've done it for two or three years now. We'll be creating an opportunity for about 50 people um, to, uh, to come back uh, to New York City this summer and do an, a more intense workshop. Um, we've got uh, particular graduate scholarships that are dedicated to C2C fellows if you come to our policy program or MBA. Um, career advising and mentoring. 
By virtue of being a C2C Fellows graduate, you have free lifetime career counseling from me, um, which means you have the privilege of any time sending me an email, and I'll try and respond as quickly as I can, have a conversation with you about directions to go. Um, and we have another, we have a mentor workshop and, and opportunities that Jess will tell you about. Um, not now, but. Um, okay, I want to close. Talked about a lot of stuff, and I'm giving you a sense of what we're going to be doing this weekend, right? We're going to be working hard on visioning, speaking, asking, networking, those core skills. Because you don't really get them in college, ironically enough. What you, you get in college, actually, you, get, you learn how to be a good writer at home. Um, that's one thing I hope you get. Uh, but, and you learn some stuff, you know, depending upon what class you're in, you, get, you learn some stuff. This is uh, Noah's Ark, right? Do you see that? Um, you all know the Noah's Ark story? Anybody here? Everybody knows the Noah's Ark story, right? Um, there's a flood coming. God says to Noah, build the ark. Uh, Noah says, God, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I'll wreck you coming. <laughs> is that how it goes? No, he says, fine, I'll build the ark, right? Okay, you want me to take in all the animals, all the creatures on the planet, two by two, two by two, bring them all in. Uh, uh, th this is a very powerful story for me. I don't know, maybe it's because I played with Noah's Ark animals when I was little. Um, but it really speaks to me personally about uh, the obligation and the moment that we're living in. Um, I, I found it interesting that I actually searched the web for images of Noah's Ark, and there aren't really that any that really speak to me. They're all kind of kiddie things or... I think an artist could really work with this vision in a powerful way that's never been done before. Because, you know, I think we're really at that moment. Um, it, we really are looking at the possibility of, of mass extinction on a scale that, you know, hasn't been seen on the planet in tens of millions of years, driven by us. Um, depending upon the career paths that we pursue over the next 30 years, we could easily see 70 or 80 percent of the species on the planet disappear within the next hundred or two hundred years, um, with massive consequences for the people who live on the planet as well, not just for those creatures. So uh, I just want to leave you with this picture. Yeah. How's that? Okay, so that's me. I skipped this picture before. So that's me graduating from college. So that's you now, more or less. Uh, that's how fast 30 years goes by. Um, and uh, you know, I, I give these talks and people say, you know, you talk about mass extinction, global warming all the time. Isn't that depressing? Doesn't that kind of make you hopeless? And again, this gets to the heart of what we were talking about in terms of what is it that, you know, drives us? You know? And for me, it, it doesn't, you know. Uh, but I have to acknowledge that there are two futures out there. One is pretty dystopic. I mean, it's the year 2100, uh, you know, it's... Uh, Post-peak oil, post-water shortage world, tribalistic politics, mass extinctions, you know, 10 degrees, 11 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it is right now, not the kind of world we want for our kids and grandkids. On the other hand, uh, you know, I work with young people like you all the time, and I know that you guys are very much alive to that second future where we uh, do make those investments in that whole suite of technologies and over the next five or 10 or 15 or 20 years, you guys take those tools and you do rewire the world with clean energy and redesign cities across the earth. And I don't know which one of those is gonna come true. I mean, I, we have to be honest, we don't know. Um, but the way I approach this is I think, you know, I am so grateful to be alive at this particular moment on the planet. Because in many ways, it's the most decisive and most human time to ever be alive. Because the actions that we're going to undertake collectively have such a profound ability to change the future, to, to create a much richer and more prosperous future for our kids. And no one has really ever had that kind of power that we have right now.